Well, we're going to be in turning, if you want to turn in your Bible, we're going to be in Luke chapter 1. Uh, we are continuing our series of what we have entitled to make his blessings flow. We're looking at the call of God to participate in his move and his work as being agents of his blessing, his gospel blessing in the world. Now today we're making a shift in the midst of that series. We, we have focused on the scope of the blessing, that it's, it's to the ends of the earth. We have looked at how we are to, to pray as a part of a significant work, that we are to, to pray for God's blessing to move to the ends of the earth. We had a call to be a part of that blessing by gathering the world in through hospitality. We called you to be generous, to participate in this blessing by being generous with your life. And then last week, uh, Pete Anderson led us and, and showed us and called us to go and to participate in the kingdom work by going and being a part of God's going work to the ends of the earth. And now we're going to shift our, our focus now for the rest of the month. We're going to continue in this series, but we're going to change the question. And we're now going to ask this question, what are the heart character qualities that we need in order to participate in God's mission? Now there's a lot of things that we would need God to form in us to make is a commitment in our lives in order to participate in his mission in this world. But as a part of this, that as a part of a Christmas series, I, we are going to look particularly at some of the characters that are involved in around the incarnation of Christ. We're going to look at Mary next week. We're going to see her submission. We're going to look at Joseph, and we're going to see his heart of courage. We're going to look at the shepherds in their awe-filled worship, and we're going to look at Simeon, who had great hope on the Sunday after Christmas. But this morning, we will not have you jump into the deep end of the pool. We will look at the character quality, the character quality of faith. But we're going to look at one who struggled with it, who, yes, is indeed called to be a part of what God did in bringing uh, the missional work of Christ to bear in this world. But there is, we're going to look at one who struggled with that call. And it's a man named Zechariah. Zechariah. I take great heart in looking at the story of Zechariah this morning because he struggles we're going to look at and we're going to see. Because when we often talk about missions, we pull out our big guns of motivational and inspirational quotes. You even heard one of them last week that Pete Anderson gave. William Carey, who is known as the father of modern missions, said this about, mission, about, about missions. He said this, expect great things from God and attempt great things for God." Now, that is a missionary statement if I've ever heard one. Get on the bandwagon, have, be a person of great faith, and do great things for God. C.T. Studd, who is the uh, quote source for most Baptist missionary calls, he was like the Twitter source for Baptist missionary calls before the Twitter world existed. He said this, only one life, and it will soon be passed. Only what is done for Christ will last. How many of you have heard that quote before? He also said this, some want to live within the sound of church or chapel bells. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. Oh, that sounds like the great, right, the great faith of our missionary warriors in the world. I think of also of Jim Elliott, right? We have many quotes from Jim Elliott that we know. He said this, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. That's a great missionary quote. He also went on, he had a number of other things he said that would, be inspi would inspire us to do great things. He said, wherever you are, be all there. Live to the hilt every situation you believe to be the will of God. Lay it on the line, he is saying. Be present. Give your life in this moment for this second. And then he had this line, when the time comes to die, make sure that all you have to do is die. Now, we of course have Paul, right? He finishes off, great Paul, who stands on the great cape, on the, on the mountain of missionary work, and he sits there with his Superman missionary cape flapping behind him, and he raises his fist and he says, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And we hear these men and other women with these great quotes, and we see their great faith, and for a moment we're inspired, and we say we want to be a part of that. We, then we walk out the door, and we face the realities of life, and our kids scream at us all the way home. And it's as like our, the, the inspiration for missions runs away like a helium balloon after a birthday party, just up into the air. But God does something in the character we're going to look at this morning to develop faith within him. Man, a man whose faith was weak, but God made him strong, and therefore he got to participate 
in the missionary work as one who worshiped Jesus, who anticipated Jesus. And so what we're going to do this morning, instead of reading the whole text, we're going to simply, it's a narrative, and so we're going to walk through the narrative chunk by chunk, section by section, and we're going to begin our first section this morning in verse 5 of Luke chapter 1. Here's what we're going to read through verse 7. And here we see in section 1, we're going to see the circumstances that challenge our faith. The cause to be ones who believe and have great faith, but there are many things that challenge us. Let's look at some of the challenges that Zechariah faced. It says this in in verse 5, In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron. That means she was from a family of priests as well. And her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and the statutes of the Lord. But they had no child. Because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. We learn from these few verses that the stage and circumstances of the rest of the story is set, but it's a stage and circumstances that are difficult to have faith in the midst of. Let's simply look at the very first phrase there in the days of Herod. This tells us actually a whole lot. It says, first, let me point out there's something going on historically that Luke, the gospel writer, is telling us. The days of Herod runs from 37 B.C. to about 4 B.C. And that may not be significant to you, but what Luke is doing is for us here is providing a dateline. And that gives us incredible context. You see, the last time in which God had spoken through any angel, through any prophet, was through the prophet Malachi. And when he spoke was in the, what was the mid-400s B.C., Now, we think of things go from smaller numbers to greater numbers. B.C., they go from larger numbers to smaller numbers. So what this means is, this is is happening in the reign of Herod, sometime between 37 B.C. and 4 B.C., and this has been the first time that God has spoken since the mid-400s. That means that God has been silent now for 400 years. Not one word from God. No promises, no sending of help. That's longer than the whole lifespan of the United States as a country. Silence. Silence. We don't like silence, do we? In my community group, we were having a time of prayer on Wednesday nights, and we we hit one of those spots where we had a, I don't know, if we'd run out of steam, and there was a moment of silence. It may have lasted for 20 seconds. It felt like an eternity. 20 seconds of silence that disrupts us and disturbs us in our modern day. But these people are not looking at 30 seconds of silence. This is 400 years of silence. I think we have all experienced a time in our life where we have prayed and God has seemingly not answered our prayers. Where you've shown up to read your Bible and it seems as if God no longer speaks through his word. He feels distant. What would it be like for God to be silent Be silent for 400 years. That's one of the contexts of what's going on here. Second, let's talk about Herod in the days of Herod. Herod, he was not a good fellow. In fact, he wasn't even a Jew. He was the king of Israel, but he was a puppet king. He ruled for about 40 years, and during that time, he had a lot of magnificent accomplishments from man speaking. He had uh, actually rebuilt the temple, but he also added to the temple many other temples. He didn't simply build a temple to Yahweh. He built temples to other pagan gods smack dab in the middle of Jerusalem. And for a good Israelite, this would have been anathema. He was so paranoid that he might lose power and authority that he killed anyone he thought could threaten him, including members of his own family. In fact, it was said of Herod that it was better to be a pig in his household than to be one of his children. Because he would at least... He would, as one who wasn't a Jew, he would try to participate in some of the laws of Jerusalem. And so he wouldn't, he would tend to try to stay away from eating pigs. So they had a better lifespan than his own children. This is how paranoid this guy was. What he was to the Jews, what Nero was to the Romans. He was a despot and he was a pawn to the Israelite oppressors. So what we have here circumstantially is we have a season in which God has been silent for 400 years And we have a cultural experience for Israel in which they are what they would have seen as darkness morally. That they are led by an evil despot. And for an Israelite, this was a time of lowliness and sorrow nationally. It was depressing to be a member of the Israelite nation. People didn't want to stick around. 
When I, I lived in, in Bosnia for a, one year in about 2005, it was about 10 years after the Yugoslavian breakup and the Civil War, and Bosnia had not at that time economically recovered from the war. So much so that while our, our, our charter was to do missions work with college students, but one of the great challenges that we faced was that the college students there had, didn't have any motivation to really go to school, they didn't have much hope for their life, and in fact, their great longing was to get out of Bosnia. Because what they viewed is they had a brain drain. To them, there was no place to get a good job. To them, there was no national pride. They wanted out. This is what is going on in Israel at this time. There is a humiliation to be an Israelite. And so what we see in verses 5 and 6, that this is the context, and yet here in verses 5 and 6, we have Zechariah in comparison to this darkness and this silence. There's, we have Zechariah, who is a priest and a righteous man, and then his wife, who is from a family of priests. She is a righteous woman. The Lord wants us to know that in the context of this evil, there is these who are simple, righteous folks, and they're living for the Lord. And they were an older couple. But then we also see that not only were they righteous, but they were also childless. Because Elizabeth was barren. She was unable to conceive. Now in those days, the, ability, the inability to conceive was an unfor- wasn't simply an unfortunate circumstance. It really was a reason for questioning the goodness of God in your life. It would have been the number one unanswered prayer in Zechariah and Elizabeth's life. It would have been essentially God was silent in bringing good into their life. That's how they would have been viewed. They would have, been, they would have looked at this and go, how, how could a priest, how could somebody who loves God not be blessed by God with a child? How could there be a man of God who is not blessed with someone to carry on his name? So they were living a very public life as a priest with a kind of shame that they carried around. And they, there was darkness and there was a silence simply to the relationship to God. And here is Zechariah and Elizabeth and they are faithful and good. And yet they had endured the faith crushing, crushing joy, stultifying experience of infertility. A barrenness year after year that screamed that God had not listened to their prayers. This is a personal silence from God. Now let me ask you this. Have you experienced something like this in your life? Something that you can't understand or fathom why God would not have given to you? God, why don't we have kids? We would make great kids. We'd make great parents. God, why am I not married? I'm watching everybody else. They stink at marriage. I think I might be pretty good at it. God, why was I overlooked for that promotion again? I don't understand this. God, why can't we seem to round the corner financially? It seems that every time there seems to be a light financially, you whack us on the head with another car payment or a medical bill. God, why can't our kids figure out life? They moved out of the house eight years ago, and yet they seem to be stumbling in every every way. Why aren't kids? Why why aren't our kids normal? Why kids? Why can't my kids behave like other kids? God, why didn't you provide? God, I prayed for the sick, and yet those who I prayed for seemed to get sicker. God, I prayed for this child in the middle of the night to stop crying, and they seemed to cry louder. God's silence. C.S. Lewis says, every war, every famine or plague, almost every deathbed experience is a monument to a petition before God that was not granted. And all you get is the deafening silence of God. What I want you to see here is that the personal experience of Zechariah and Elizabeth functions as a metaphor for the full life of Israel. They have experienced God's silence, and so has Israel. God has gone dark. After Malachi, God had been silent for 400 years. Herod was on the throne. Things are bad. Where is God? And we must admit that the silence of God, his seemingly long absences, his unanswered prayers, and his difficult providences, and the dark days in which he leads us are real challenges to our faith. They do make us question. They do make us wonder, where is he? Trusting an unseen God can be hard, and we struggle with the years and years of unanswered prayer while Zechariah and Elizabeth are going on decades of unanswered prayer, and Israel counts God's silence in centuries, in centuries. Here's the next section, though. In verse 8, we enter a new section in the narrative. In this section, we encounter what we could call the promises that demand faith. 
We have some challenges to our faith in the first couple of verses. Now the promises that demand faith, picking up in verse 8. Now, while he was serving, this is Zechariah, as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple and to burn incense. And the whole multitude of, of the people of God were praying outside at the hour of incense. Let me explain what is going on here. During this season of the life of Israel, there would have been about 18,000 priests. Only 14 of those in a given year were allowed to go into the holy of holy place, not the holy of holies, the holy place, which is the area just outside the holy place, and to bring this incense and these sacrifices before God and to bring these prayers for the people before God. So in 10 years, only 140 priests. In 100 years, only about 14 of the 18,000. Therefore, what Zechariah is getting here is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And in fact, that was exactly what it is. Once a priest had actually been chosen by lots to serve in this capacity, they can never do it again. This is, this is Zechariah's vocational bright and shining moment. He has been chosen to go into God's very presence to bring his prayers and to bring prayers for the people of God before God himself. And the job that God chooses Zechariah to do is to offer these incense and these prayers in the holy place. And we pick up in verse 11 and keep going. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. So very briefly, here he is. He's taking the incense of offering before the Lord, and he's offering these prayers, and suddenly an angel appears. And the normal thing occurs when an angel appears. People get scared because angels are frightening. Zechariah is scared, and so the angel tells him, well, in a very compassionate way, he says, don't be afraid. And then the angel carries on, picking up in verse 13. Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall, you shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the obedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. So the angel comes to Zechariah, and he says, your prayer has been heard. But this goes way beyond simply, congrats, it's a boy. The angel declares what his name will be. His name is going to be John. This is who we will know as John the Baptist. Then he says he will be great before the Lord. Then he says this son will be set aside to be filled by the Holy Spirit. And this son will be a prophet with a ministry similar to Elijah. And that's exactly what he is, right? John the Baptist ends up hanging out in the desert a lot. He wears some uncomfortable clothes. He eats honey and locusts. But even more importantly, he has a ministry like Elijah. And that his great call as a prophet is to come to the people of Israel and say, repent. In fact... John the Baptist, just like Elijah did, is going to go before the king of Israel, and he's going to look at him in the face and say, you should repent. And this is why John the Baptist ultimately gets his head cut off by Herod. But he's going to go to a disobedient people, and he's going to call to them to repent. And through his ministry, John the Baptist's ministry, revival will break out, and repentance will happen, and fathers will turn to their children, and they will be restored, and the disobedient will become a people who seek justice and oh, and one final thing, this son's ministry will prepare the way for the coming of the Lord's Messiah himself. Now that's a lot more going up than simply the angel showing up and setting off blue fireworks announcing that it's going to be a boy. Something more is going on here. This is no mere gender reveal party. I want to connect the dots. First, the angel says, for your prayers have been answered. And the question would be, what prayers? And we can assume it is the prayers that they, he and Elizabeth have prayed for a child for many years. But a couple of things actually speak about being, that being what Zechariah is praying about. First, Zechariah and Elizabeth are old. Like, really old. They are now well beyond childbearing years. More than likely, it had been years since they had stopped praying for a child. That day was dead and gone. Those prayers have long since been silenced. Second, there is the issue of immediate context. 
Zechariah, his job, his role is to go into the holy place as a representative of all of Israel and to pray for Israel as a nation, not to be bringing his own personal desires. In other words, what he goes into the holy place is he is praying prayers that are corporate and grand in scope. He is praying for things like repentance in Israel, for the forgiveness of sins for Israel, for justice to reign in Israel, for the spiritual darkness to lift, for the Roman oppression to be removed, and for the evil destroyers to be, evil rulers to be destroyed. So here's the most likely scenario and what actually commentators think is going on. Zechariah is praying for revival and holiness and justice and freedom in Israel. But then wonder of wonders, God's answer is this. Okay, you want these things for Israel? I will bring revival. I will bring repentance. And I will send one who will set the people free and bring them life once again. And I'm going to do this in part through the very son that you have longed for so long ago. Do you see what's going on? In other words, this is the proverbial killing two birds with one stone. God promises to answer Zechariah and Elizabeth's prayer from so long ago, their personal prayer, as a means of answering Zechariah's corporate prayer for Israel. The one who God will provide to Elizabeth is the one who will point the way of the Messiah. This very one, this son, will be the one who will meet the corporate needs of Israel. The king and the Messiah they have longed for is coming. And the one who will prepare the way is the son that Zechariah and Elizabeth have longed for. So that's one thing that's going on. Second, do you, there's something assumed here. 400 years of silence. Suddenly God is doing what? God is speaking again. You see, there was a whole, there was a lot of, history in of Israel where some direction by God and the voice of God would have been nice and and you know there's all these wars and these people who come and take over Israel and they persecute the people and there's all these horrible things that happen spiritually and God is silent for all those years and then suddenly here in this moment God finally pipes up for a gender reveal party this is what he's actually talking about this is what gets him to to open up his mouth here's what is really crazy God picks up though right where he left off at, at the end of the Old Testament Let's look back at the very last two verses of the Old Testament. It's Malachi, chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. And here's what it says there. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their father, lest I come and strike the land with a uh, decree of utter destruction. Now, do you remember, how does the angel describe this son that God is going to give to Zechariah and Elizabeth? What's he say? Verse 16 and 17. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before them in the spirit and power of Elijah and turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. What is the angel referring back to? Malachi. Here's what's going on. Have you ever been in a conversation, perhaps it's you and your wife, and your children come interrupt you, and about an hour later you pick up right back where you left off? In which, you know, you're all the pronouns you're referring to, it and this and that. And hey, remember we're going to talk about, you're referring back to the conversation that you started an hour ago and you just kind of pick right back up where you left off. That's what's happening here. But have you ever been in a conversation that got interrupted for 400 years? That's what's happening. Because that is what is happening. It's as if God has cleared his throat like an old professor. <clears throat> oh, where were we? Oh, yes. A, lot, a prophet like Elijah. And fathers returning to their children. Let's pick that up again. The prophecy of God picks up right where the conversation had ended 400 years earlier. The angel's announcement is that God is preparing to fulfill his promises as if not one single day has gone by. You see, the God of heaven and earth exists outside of time. And to him, as it says in other places, a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day is as a day. God is not slow to fulfill his promises as we count slowness. I love what they say in some old churches. He may not come when you want him to. He may not come on the time as you would think of it, but he is always on his time. He may not come when you want him, but he is always on time. 
That's the message of the angel to Zechariah. He may not have come when you wanted him when you were younger, but God is always on time. Just because the answer of the Lord has been delayed in your mind, do not think that your prayers have necessarily gone unheeded. You may be here this morning and you have had prayers that seemingly now seem to be hopeless. You have prayed for certain children of yours to be restored for 5, 10, 20 years. And they seem as far from God as they ever were. Well, perhaps God has simply not delayed in his answer. Perhaps your God has taken your prayer and caught it up into a larger kingdom and redemptive purposes. Perhaps God has a larger plan for your child and for your life. Remember what we looked at when we looked at the end of Ephesians chapter 3? That God's primary answers are not yes, no, or maybe. His primary answer is more. And that's what God's answer is to Zechariah and Elizabeth. And this is enormous. If you're going to participate in the mission of God, if you're going to be able to say inspirational quotes like that, if you're going to take on the hard task of missional work and to participate in the missional work of God, even when the darkness of this world surrounds and even when it appears that God is silent, your heart is going to have to cling to this aspect of who God is. That God is able to keep his promises and to carry out his plans on earth despite what the circumstances look like. This is the truth of this passage. Will you cling to the promises of God? This is the call of section two. Promises to be held on to with faith. Section three. Pick it up in verse 18. The consequences from the failure of faith. And Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I am an old man. My wife is advanced in years, and the angel answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. I was sent to speak to you and to bring you the good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things have taken place. Because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them. And he remained mute. Here's what we see in this section. Zechariah doubts. Gabriel rebutes. God disciplines. You see, Zechariah's awareness that God was at work, the news that he and his wife were going to have a baby, well, this was kind of a heavy blow to his psyche. To be fair, Z was old, wasn't he? And so was his wife. As my grandparents used to say, Zechariah had one foot on the grave and one foot on a banana peel. He was old. And he focused on his elderliness. Zechariah had spent too long growing comfortably pessimistic. And as his age rose in number, his faith narrowed in the scope of what God could do. Did you hear me? As his age rose in number, his faith narrowed in the scope of what God could do. You see, there was something lacking in his faith for sure. And while God does mighty things, even with weak faith, we must recognize that our unbelief is indeed a capital sin. And it's destructive to the mission of God. You see, unbelief is a worldview that looks upon the world failing to take into account the power and the character and the ability of our God. And such belief is a faith that is forgotten at least, or perhaps at worst, even accuses God of inability or unwillingness to do good. The angel speaks about hope in an area where Zechariah and his wife have experienced pain. And it's at that place of pain that Zechariah's faith slips down like through a black hole. The pain of no child, the pain of old age. You see, though, but faith, the faith that God has given us, is not different from a world that acknowledges that when you're older, you're less likely to have a child. But we have a faith that knows this world differently because we see it through the lens of a God who is able. But Zechariah's faith could not get there, so he doubts. Well, the angel rebukes. (laughs) I find his rebuke kind of funny. What does he say? Let me tell you who I am, Mr. Too Old. I am Gabriel. Listen, you you don't know who you're talking to. I am not one of those run-of-the-mill, everyday, rank-and-file angels. I am Gabriel. I am an archangel. And you know where I hang out every day? I hang out in the very immediate presence of God. And he gave me a message to tell you. And he says you're having a baby, so you better get used to it, big fella. Oh, and why don't you just shut up for a while? (laughs) This is what he tells Zechariah. 
don't tell me you're too old. God disciplines him with what? Silence. God disciplines Zechariah with muteness and most likely with deaf- deafness because in verse 62, what we see when John is actually finally born, they're having to make signs to Zechariah. Hey, what do you want this kid's name to be? So he's mute and he's deaf. He's mute and deaf. This brings us to section four, the discipline that cultivates faith. This is verses 23 through 25, and then we'll drop down to the end of the story. And when this, his, service, his service had ended, he went to his home. And after these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me, to take away my approach among the people. Then drop down to verse 57. We'll read through verse 66. And the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son, and her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her, and on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child. And they would have called him Zechariah after the name of his father, but his mother answered, No, he shall be called John. And they said to her, None of your relatives is called by this name. And they made signs to the father, right, he's deaf, inquiring what he might want to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, His name is John. And they all wondered, and immediately his mouth was opened, his tongue was loosed, and he spoke, blessing. He spoke, blessing God. And fear came on all their neighbors, and all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, what then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord is with him. Here we get to the point of transformation from unbelief to belief. They made signs to him what he would have his child called. And he asked for a writing tablet, and he writes his name is John. Do you, understand, you see the difference? It's interesting. Elizabeth says his name shall be John. What does John say? His name is John. Because he says, listen, you know what? Nine months ago, an angel came and told me that his name is John, so he's already been named. He's already been named. This transformation, what we see here is that he now believes what God has told him. That God's promises, to, he trusts God's promises such that he is willing against the cultural mores of the day to name his kid after himself and to name him this name, John. But now that's a very simple act of obedience. But in this act, Zechariah goes from a man muted because of his unfaithfulness to a man bursting forth in praise. Because what follows these passages is a song by Zechariah that is now known as the Benedictus. That he begins to give voice, a song of praise and worship to God. In fact, about five or six years ago, here at King's Chapel, we did a sermon series. We looked at the songs, Mary's song and Zechariah's songs. Now here, I have some bad news and good news for you this morning. In what we see in the discipline of God. Here's the bad news. God will discipline us for our unbelief. God will discipline his children for their unfaithfulness. But here's the good news. What we see in the life of Zechariah is that God's discipline is an act of grace that cultivates and recultivates faith within us. You see, faith is cultivated in the experience of experiencing God's gracious discipline. Look at the manner of God's discipline in Zechariah's life and what he does. First, God's discipline is what for Zechariah? Silence. Silence by himself? No. Silence that blocks out all other noise except for God. He is struck with both muteness and deafness. That means he can hear nothing and he can say nothing. You know how much quiet time you get if you're mute and deaf? A lot of quiet time. Zechariah is left alone with nothing to do but to study God's word and in the utter silence to enjoy God's presence in the midst of the silence. Let me tell you what's going on here. We have, uh, we have this thing that we, we've started to do in this, you know, this, this world of like very much more sensitive parenting and psychologically based parenting. We've learned that particularly with some of our more sensitive children, we don't have timeouts in our family, we've been told, at least. That, that's not what's, timeouts are out. No more timeouts. Here's what we have in our family. We have time ins. We are very progressive parents. If you're as good at parenting as we are, you would have time ins, not timeouts. Now, here's the, this is an insane little difference. Is what it, here's what it means. Is what they teach a child in regards to connection with a parent is don't send them away from you in the discipline, but put them in a place where they have to be physically near you. Yes, they have to be quiet. Yes, they have to stay in one place. But it's a time in with you, not a time out that separates them from you. 
So here's this has been particularly important with our adopted son, in which we have connection issues. And which is to say, here's what his discipline is sometimes. Son, you no longer get to go play with your brothers and sisters. You don't get no longer to get to go have that snack. Here's what you have to do. It's a time in time in which you have to come sit on my lap and you have to, let, you have to snuggle with dad. You see the difference? One is disconnecting and separating and punishing. The other is come near and spend time with me. Let, let my body help you emotionally regulate. That's what God is doing for Zechariah. He's saying, listen, I'm not giving you a time out. I'm giving you a time in. You have nothing to do now for the next nine months but talk to me and listen to me. A time in with God. Sometimes God sidelines us. He says, why don't you take a time out from ministry for a while? Why don't you take a time out from these things that you've been so busy with? Why don't you take a time out and why don't you come and sit with me? Why don't you get and quiet your heart with me? Nine months of silence. And maybe one of the things we could learn from that is one of the great lessons for you this Advent season is maybe it's time for you to sit back and be quiet. To sit at the feet of Jesus, to be still and know that he is God. But do you see the purposes of God in his discipline? This is not punishment. This is graciousness. God's discipline is meant to form us, not to destroy us. And the purpose of God's discipline in your life is actually to lead you to overflowing joy and worship in him. Because that's what happens in Zechariah's life. But I also want you to see this. Not only does God's discipline draw Zechariah in towards God to spend time with him, but God's discipline is laced with grace. He says, you're going to have a child. Zechariah goes, I'm not sure I believe that. And God goes, you're having a child anyways. You see, what we see here is that even in the midst of God's discipline, God keeps his promises. In other words, in the midst of even our unfaithfulness, your God is faithful. Elizabeth still miraculously conceives God is faithful to keep his promises even in the face of Zechariah's lack of faithfulness. The need for discipline did not invalidate the promise of God, that God had already given. And here's what I want you to see. We go back to the first point we're saying the same, say the same exact thing. Participation in the mission of God is reestablished when we witness God's faithfulness in the face of our unfaithfulness. You said earlier that the heart of faith that leads one to participate in the missional work of God is the heart that clings to the ability of God to keep his promises, even in the face of silence, even in the face of the darkness and the circumstances around us. But also know this, that your God is able in his faithfulness to keep and carry out his promises, even in the face of your unfaithfulness. This is what your God can do. And so let me ask you this. Perhaps you're in one of those seasons of life in which it appears that God is silent, in which the circumstances seem to be closing in on you, in which your prayers and your cries have gone unanswered, and yet the God, the call of God is to continue to trust him and to participate in his mission. That simply because you failed here yesterday doesn't mean that you bail out of today's mission. No, it means you get up and you participate, and you trust him and you get engaged. But how do you do that? How do you do that in the midst of difficult circumstances in which it appears that God is not answering your prayers? How do you do that in the midst of what appears to be your unfaithfulness? There was an amazing tweet I saw this week. Many of you saw it as well. A man whose name is prominent around here because he is a mentor from a distance for so many of us, a guy named Tim Keller. Tim Keller struggled with pancreatic cancer for the last couple of years. He's been in deep and significant chemotherapy, and they're hoping that the signs that this cancer would be eradicated. But he announced on Friday, he said this, I now have stage four pancreatic cancer, but it is endlessly comforting to have a God who is infinitely more wise and more loving than I am. He has plenty of good reasons for everything he does, and there lies my hope and my strength. What does he know? How can he continue to participate in God's mission and proclaim the glory of God in the midst of what appears to be God's unanswered prayers to him? How can he be sure that God is faithful Even in the midst of cancer, how can you be sure that God is faithful in whatever he has challenged you with? Well, I might, I'll simply point this morning to close to the worship of Zechariah. And we don't have time to jump into the nuts and bolts of what Zechariah sings in his song of worship and what the church history has called the Benedictus. But I'll simply read a few verses from it. Here's what he says, picking up in verse 8. You guys won't have it on the screen, I forgot to give it to them. 
But see, Luke chapter 1, verse 68 through 72, it says this. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, and he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from all our enemies and turn from the hand of all who hate us. That he has come to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. When you hear holy covenant, think promises. And verse 78, and because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. You hear what he's proclaiming? How can you know that God is going to be faithful to you in whatever darkness you face? Because God has been faithful to all the promises in the Old Testament, saying, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm going to come provide for you, and he has done so. This is the gospel of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. That he said, I've been silent, you feel like I'm distant from you, how about I come in the flesh? How about I come, and as it says in the New Testament, all the promises of the Bible are yes in Christ Jesus. That this is a God who is faithful, and he is willing to show the links to which he will be faithful to his covenant by saying, I will come in and take on flesh, and I will come dwell amongst you, and I will take on your sin, and I will take on your death, and I will defeat all that is against you. These are my promises to you, and praise God, he has done it in Christ Jesus. That's what Zechariah sees. And how does he describe what Jesus is going to be? It's a beautiful description. As a sunrise coming over the horizon. What's he doing? Israel is caught circumstantially in what? Utter darkness. And yet, in the midst of whatever darkness you face, that I face, that Israel face, we have rising over the horizon, over the hills, the promises of God being fulfilled in Christ Jesus, in the flesh of Christ. It's the good news of the gospel of the incarnation. Praise be to the Lord. Let's celebrate that he has come to us. Heavenly Father, we thank you in Christ Jesus that you have fulfilled all of your promises. That, Lord, even in the midst of where it may feel like a season of silence for some in this room or deep darkness, that, Lord, you have already spoken. You have spoken loud and clear through the incarnation of Jesus that you will come near to the brokenhearted, that you will come as the light to those in the darkness. And so by the spirit of the living God, I pray for those in this room who may be in a season of difficulty and they're questioning your goodness and your ability. Would you remind them again that our God is able? Would you remind them again of, of your past faithfulness? of how you've proven over and over and over again in the story of the Bible, and yes, even anecdotally in our own lives, you have shown that you're a faithful God. So we come to celebrate what it took for you to be faithful this morning. Would you join us now and extend to us much grace to make your light shine upon us through the bread and the cup. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.